in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his second letter. He is describing some limitation of a physical nature. And he said, three times I besought the Lord to have this leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Here we see grace equated with the power of God. And weakness equated with the human form. What was the nature of the weakness is not described. Scholars have speculated throughout the centuries. Some claim an impediment of speech, for if you go out to tell the story that all things are possible to God, and yet you can't tell it because of some impediment. Or suppose you had a paralysis, and you could not demonstrate your physical prowess. But that is not all. These bodies, as we were them, we are the sons of God who come down. And these bodies are subject to and must be experienced by all and we will experience pain no matter who we are. We will experience want no matter who we are. And we will experience concupiscence no matter who we are. That is part of the nature of the bodies that we wear. Day after day you need food so you are in want. And no matter how strong you are, there are moments, even if you wait to the very end and you are declining, there is pain. So pain, want, and concupiscence are the experiences of the bodies of flesh and blood that we wear. Now Paul does not state what it is, but in stating what he did, he equates grace with the power of God. And he equates weakness with the qualities that I've just described, with that physical body that we wear. Now we will turn to the restoration of the temple, which is the book of Zechariah. The word Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. I turn now to the 8th chapter of Zechariah, and these are the words. Now, I have come back to Zion. This is the Lord speaking. Now says the Lord, I have come back to Zion. Therefore, he must have departed from Zion to come back to it. I have come back to Zion. And I will dwell in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts shall be called the holy mountain. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. And even though the inhabitants, the survivors of the nation, will say it is impossible, an impossible thing, I will say it is wonderful also to me. Now we are dealing tonight with a power unknown to mortal man. And yet I tell you from experience, you will exercise this power. Even though you have these bodies of weaknesses, you will, towards the end of your journey, exercise this power as you begin to return to Zion. For you are the Lord spoken of in Scripture. You are the Lord God Jehovah, who foretold it all, who became man, and you became man and assumed all the weaknesses of man 
and now having experienced the weaknesses because you could not as the Lord God Jehovah in your glorified body experience pain experience want experience concupiscence so to have the experience of these you became man they belong to the weaknesses of body called man so now you return now the Lord returns, comes back to Zion. Now let me share with you an experience of mine, and you can do with it as you will. Come to your own conclusion concerning this power. It was the 20th of July, 1959. My return to Zion was preceded by a dream and the dream I have just told you in that eighth chapter of Zechariah for the restoration of the temple the temple has been fragmented it's been scattered now it's been reassembled into a living temple as we are told in scripture you are the temple of the living God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So this fragmented body is being gathered together one by one, but this time they are living stones so that you and I are not returned as animated bodies, but life-giving spirits, life within ourselves. And that life is demonstrated in the exercise of a power unknown to mortal men. It began in a dream. And here is my dream. The buildings were not more than maximum three stories tall. Most of them, I would say, two. Lovely, as far as architectural structures go, they're beautiful. I only saw the exteriors. I'm on the street. The streets were as wide as four of our boulevards put together. That's how wide the streets were. The sidewalks were far wider than the widest part of Wiltshire Boulevard, the sidewalks. At stated intervals, there were concert grand pianos, free of charge to any artist who would like to play. Each artist had his own following of boys and girls boys and girls all over the street ranging in age from say seven to twelve not more all lads and all lassies i sat at a piano this lovely concert grand and then i saw this artist coming with his following all the boys and girls around him and he came over and as he came to the piano I rose and offered him the seat. He thanked me and he sat down and he began to play. And as he played, I not only heard the most glorious heavenly music coming out of that instrument, but I saw it. I saw the geometrical patterns that the music produced. Beautiful patterns as it came out, all in color. As I sat there, or I stood there watching him, I knew that I could arrest that music. I could stop time. And he couldn't play, and no one could move, and the music could not continue in this wonderful motion. It would freeze. And I froze it within myself by arresting within me, in my own imagination, an activity which allowed it to be animated. And as it froze, and I am admiring the beauty of it, from that moment I actually began to awake. It moved from this dream into vision, into the heavenly experience that I have described time and again to you, where I awoke within my own skull. Now, the Lord has come back to Zion. Zion is your skull. Jerusalem is where he dwells. The word Zion, the word Bethlehem, the word Jerusalem, 
the words city of David are all equated in scripture so now the Lord has returned and come back to Zion could that arrestment of that cord be the thing that woke me I ask you to dwell upon it I only know I saw what I saw I only know that I arrested it within me and that sustained motion within me for nothing else moved everything froze because I was in myself froze it was that the cord was that the tone that woke me from the deep sleep when I came back from my journey for I journeyed into the world believing myself to be a man playing all the parts and experiencing pain experiencing want experiencing concupiscence and all these things I experienced and then in that moment with that city filled with boys and girls here I hear the most heavenly music I saw the results of the music and I wanted to actually examine it closely and I froze it I froze it not there I froze it in myself at the moment that I saw that beautiful pattern I froze it and then I awoke within my skull for that set up within me the most fantastic vibration within my skull and as it began to reverberate and I thought my head would split I awoke but I awoke within my skull to find myself entombed entombed in my own skull and then came the birth from above and then following in a matter of 1260 days all the events as described in scripture so now says the Lord I have come back to Zion and I will dwell in Jerusalem and Jerusalem will be called the city of truth that's the only truth in the world all else is all illusion the whole vast world is one grand illusion and this was before that the world was this was set up as the way that he would bring himself back to Zion bring himself back to Jerusalem not Jerusalem in the Near East Jerusalem is right here in your own skull that's the only Zion mentioned in scripture that's the only city of David that's the only really home of the Lord so the power of which I speak in scripture when he equates grace with power my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness while I slept that night a weak man perfectly weak like an any normal person in this world always and then that power was made perfect in my weakness and then the Lord returned to Zion and as he came back to the city that is called the city of truth and he said I am the truth and the story of Jesus Christ is the only truth in the world then the whole story began to unfold in me so I returned to Zion in this state having arrested music and that music was a song it was perfectly wonderful but at a certain moment I had the impulse to arrest it and I arrested the note that awoke me just as though you strike a note and that which is related to it if you sustain the note you could break it you can break a crystal if the note is sustained that is related to that crystal and so here I broke the crystal and returned and then the thing unfolded within me so this is the power of which scripture speaks the power that no one on earth understands you speak of an atomic bomb the hydrogen bomb these are little firecrackers because here you have the power to arrest time you take the whole vast world and arrest it and it can't move you change the motivation of the thing arrested 
And when you release within you that power, then the whole thing begins to move because time is now released and it changes its motivation and fulfills the change, not what it originally intended. Do you know what that would mean to the world if they were not first incorporated into the body of love? So we are told he gives us many gifts, but the greatest of all gifts is love. And God is love. So you're first called and incorporated into the body of God. And when you stand in the presence of embodied love, you are incorporated into love. That thereafter, when you have the power within you, you exercise it always motivated with love. If you were not incorporated into the body of love and you had the power to arrest time and change the motivation of the things arrested and then release time, you could destroy the world. But you will not, not in eternity, will you have the right to exercise this power or will you ever know about it in the true sense of the word until you're first called you are elected and you are called you answer correctly when he asks you to name the greatest thing in the world and you will answer and you'll say love and love will embrace you and you will be actually fused with the body of love infinite love from then on you will have taste and taste of this power you will have moments when you will see the world moving and suddenly you will stop it and not a thing can move because you will stop it and then you will change it and then change the entire flow but you'll do it in love others will not know it let them say what they will let them believe that they're finding out greater and greater powers in the world like unlocking the atom unlocking something else let them do it perfectly all right the day will come you will know who you really are that you really are the one who created the whole vast universe and you yourself limited yourself to these garments of flesh that you may know want <coughs> no pain no concupiscence and you will come down and wear these garments and not pretend that you're wearing them you will wear them and then in the end you will return and come back to Zion and when you come back to Zion you will now enter the city of Jerusalem and you will find it full as you're told full of boys and girls all playing in the streets and then there will be that heavenly chord. The imagery is perfect. All of a sudden, not only you hear music, you see music. You see the most heavenly pattern that is forming, all in color. And you're so entranced with what you see, you desire to see it more. And then all of a sudden, you know you can stop it. And inwardly, you stop it by arresting in you that which allowed it to be animated and you arrest that in you and as you see it then you begin to awaken and you awake within your skull so when I pray as he said three times I prayed and I besought him to take from me this thorn within my side and three times he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness and so the power was equated with grace so we use the word grace thinking only in one sense all through his letters he speaks of the grace of God and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and he speaks always of the grace of God the source of grace is always God Jesus Christ is the God ordained means by which grace is received by man. For Jesus Christ is the pattern in man by which this power is conveyed to man. And that man 
is God himself. You are the Lord Jehovah. You are the God who went out from Zion. You are the God who will return to Zion. And you are the God who will awake within Jerusalem, within Zion. And then the city will be full of boys and girls playing in the street. And you will hear that eternal note that you set up in the beginning. Which when you hear it, it's the voice of God calling. Calling himself back. Deep speaks unto deep. And you call back to yourself from the experience of pain. From the experience of want. And the experience of concupiscence. For in your glorified body these cannot exist. They do not exist. Yet you will have experienced them. And therefore you will have increased and expanded by reason of the experience of that call to witnesses of flesh and blood. So when Blake took this thought, he took it, say, from the 53rd and the 14th chapter of Psalm. He called it Babel, but the psalm speaks of it as the fool. The fool says in his heart, there is no God, no Son of God. That thou, of human imagination, O divine body, art all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord, when thou arisest upon my weary eyes, even in this dungeon and in this iron mill, thou also sufferest with me, even though I behold thee not. And then the divine voice answers him. And the voice replies, Fear not. Lo, I am with you always. Only believe in me that I have power to raise from death thy brother who sleeps in Albion. Again, he's emphasizing the power. So let the fool say there is no God, and let him say there is no Son of God. He now equates not only the Son of God, but God the Father with the human imagination. And then he said it was his task forever and forever. It is my eternal task to open the eternal world, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards into the world of thought into eternity, ever expanding in the bosom of God, the human imagination. So he speaks of the human imagination as the eye of God. He mentions the seven eyes in Zechariah, and he mentions the seventh as Jesus. The first was Lucifer. The seventh was Jesus, but he calls the eighth one. Now the word letter 8, or the number 8, is resurrection. He rose on that 8th day, which was the first of the new week. 8 is always associated with resurrection. So he calls the 8th by name, and the 8th hid and would not come. In his strange symbolism, the 8th is the individual, it's you. You are the 8th he's calling. And he is calling the 8th to come, as the 8th eye of God. God is not complete without that individual, without that eight. You are the one called. As told us in the same Zechariah, he calls them all, and there were just as many as at the end as they were of old. Not one is missing. Not one is lost. You can't be lost. But the eighth eye is your own wonderful human imagination. And one day it will open. And you will look into eternity. Into all the glories that are completely shut out to mortal man. He can't see them. And he can't believe in them. He denies them. He thinks himself so wise. So altogether wise. And they give themselves each other all kinds of ribbons. And all kinds of medals 
that pin each other with medals. I saw today's paper where Bob Hope, they want to give him an honorary degree in some college, and the students and the faculty said, no, he is not entitled to it because, first of all, he's not a college man. He never went to college, and he is not qualified to receive an honorary degree in, I forget what the letter was. It could be in law, it could be in something else, but he is not qualified, and they opposed it. So the chances are he will not get it, as though he needs it. I mean, what on earth comes some little degree that's an honorary degree? He didn't earn it. No, he didn't go to college. He didn't go and study for it. But they give these degrees all the time to people. And so he is not eligible because he isn't a college man. Yet people want them, and they pin them up all over the place. I will not mention his name. I have a friend of mine who is a doctor. And he took course after course in hypnosis. He's a regular doctor. But all these degrees are on his wall in hypnosis. So proud of the fact that someone gave him this because he paid the price for it. And they're all over his wall. I'm embarrassed when I sit in this office and look at them. Because he really is a very, very fine doctor in his own profession. Why all this nonsense all over the wall? People are so proud of all these silly little things. I tell you, you are the God of gods. You are the Lord who created the whole thing. You are the Lord who willingly became man to experience all the weakness and all the limitations of man. So you've come down into this world to play this part. And one day, you'll return to Zion. And you will know that story of the 8th chapter of Zechariah. And now, says the Lord, I have come back to Zion. Back to Jerusalem, where I will dwell. To come back, he must have left it. You are the one who went out. And you are the one who will come back. And when the night comes and you come back, you will see that street full to overflowing with boys and girls. And you too will hear the music. And you too will know you could stop it and see what you are actually now observing. And as you contemplate the beauty of music, not only audibly, but visually, and you're looking at it, and then you begin to awake because the sound is sustained by you. You're sustaining an oath. And you yourself awoke yourself. Oh, you came back. And you prearranged your return. But when you hear this note, this sound, it is called in Scripture the sound of the last trumpet. Well, the word trumpet means reverberation. And you will actually hear it, and you will see it, and it will reverberate within you. And you will hear it almost, I was exploding your brain. And then you will awake in the very place where you laid yourself down to dream the dream of life. And you went forward dreaming the dream of life in a strange land. And you became enslaved and you suffered and experienced pain and want and all these things. And then came that moment in time where you return. And so you return into your own being. And you awaken. And when you awaken, you are God himself. There is nothing in this world but God. So everyone here would experience it. But everyone. You are here because you are near to it. There are millions tonight who would walk out of this place just like the gentleman who did. This was not his cup of tea. He came to hear something along mundane lines. He came to hear something where he could turn it into a quick dollar. Not knowing if he heard this, he could turn it into a very fast dollar. And an honest one not a quick one, of which you would be ashamed, 
but a very fast one, of which you'd be very proud to have. Just listening to what you heard this night, where you are not completely held by the body, where you're floating away into the state that you are destined to be. Do you know that while you're doing that, marvelous things are taking place within you by your true being, who knows far better than your surface mind your needs? The Father knows far better what you need than your rational mind knows. And so while you're listening and suspending the rational mind and listening to his story, he is working within you. And then in a way you do not know, he brings into your world gifts, all kinds of gifts, until finally he gives you the greatest of all gifts, which is himself. For he's giving it to himself because he became you. And that gift is love. The greatest power in the world. So when Blake mentioned the seven eyes, starting off with Lucifer, who would not sacrifice himself for anyone, then he goes through to the Moloch, who feels that all problems could be solved by annihilating all opposition. So that I was no good. Then he comes to the Elohim, who feels that he will set up judgment of everything in the world and pass judgment on all things. Then he comes to all the others and finally comes to the one willing to sacrifice self for his brothers that he called friends. And then he calls the eighth. And the eighth did not come. He cannot come until that moment in time when the whole dream is over. And then he returns, but when he returns, he is the Lord God himself. He comes back to Zion, into that city of truth called Jerusalem. And all the streets are filled, they're full of boys and girls playing in the streets. And those who are present will say, it is impossible. But the one who has the experience, he will say also, it is wonderful also to me. For I can tell you when it happens to you, the awe that possesses you, the wonder that possesses you, you know on the surface it is impossible. And yet you can't deny the experience. It did happen, and you can't deny it. So those that did not receive the experience, they will say it is impossible, but the one who experienced it will say it is wonderful. How can a man in this age look into the face of one who history records as having lived 3,000 years ago and know without any uncertainty he's looking into the face of his own son? I know that the son knows he is his father. Not only that he knows he is the father of the son, but the son knows it. And here there's a stretch of time. Now, others say that's impossible. But he knows it is wonderful. And he knows with such certainty that it is wonderful. Now, I have quoted tonight from the New English Bible. The eighth chapter of the book of Zechariah, which means Jehovah remembers. If he remembers, there must have been a moment when he forgot. And that's the whole story of the Bible. Though you were rich, you became poor. That these who were poor might become rich. And then you return where you have no want. You return to your glorified state where there is no want, where there is no hunger, where there is no pain. And you're above the organization of sex, therefore above concupiscence. And this is your destiny. 
So tonight, you might think this a profoundly spiritual one. And yet I tell you, time will prove to you it was a profoundly practical one. But while you were listening, he worked in the depths of yourself and all your needs are met. Now, in a practical way, bring before your mind's eye a scene which would imply the fulfillment of your desire. Let it be perfectly still. You can freeze it, can't move unless you allow it to move. Tell it what it is supposed to hear. Tell it what it is supposed to do. It is supposed to hear that you are, a you name what you want it to hear. Bring anyone before your mind's eye. Bring any group before your mind's eye. See it clearly in your mind's eye. And then tell it the frozen statues before you what it's going to hear about you. And then you tell it, I am, and you name it, I am successful, or I am healthy, or I am wealthy, or I just name it, and then release it in you and see the animated faces smiling. They have got to go forward and move things in your world to hear that concerning you. You've got to. Just try it. Bring them into your mind's eye. See them just as I would see you now. But let them be perfectly still. And then tell them what they're going to hear about you. And you name what they're going to hear. And then release them. You've changed all motivation concerning that statement. They've got to hear what you say they will hear. Others say it's impossible, and you will say it is wonderful. And in a way that no one knows, they are working towards the fulfillment of it. For their attitude has changed towards you, and they will change by their thinking attitudes of others towards you. And eventually you will become the one that you assume that you are, as you tell them that you are. They're all frozen. All things are within you. All that you behold, though it appears without, it is within. In your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. So, you saw it, they're all within you. Where do you see them? In your imagination. But you saw them and you freeze them, and then you tell them what they're going to hear. And then you allow them to smile and empathize with you, not sympathize, empathize with you. And then you drop it, confident that they are now under your command, and they've got to go forward and fulfill what you have commanded them to do. That's the whole vast world in which we live. Those in great eternity who contemplate on death, said thus, what seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be, and is productive of the most dreadful consequences to those to whom it seems to be, even of torments, despair, and eternal death. But divine mercy steps beyond and redeems men in the body of Jesus. So whatever seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be. So you bring them into your mind's eye. You see them clearly in your mind's eye. And you tell them what you not want them to hear about you. You tell them this is what you will hear about me in the immediate present. And then release them. They were frozen, motivation changed, and then they were released to fulfill your command. That's what you're going to do eventually. In the twinkle of an eye, 
when you no longer wear these garments that are subject to pain and to want. So when you read the word grace, don't think of some little thing that the churches talk about. Think about it as Paul intended it to be thought. And that is power. And he defined the power of God as Christ. He said Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And when he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You remain wearing that garment that is weak, and I'll perfect my power in you, that garment that is weak. And one day, you'll return to Zion, and you will exercise this power. And while he plays, you will freeze it, and you will see it, and sustain what you're seeing, and it will awaken you from the dream of life, awaken you within the tomb, and to prove that you do have the wisdom of God, you will know exactly what to do to get out. And you do. And unaided by any midwife, you come out. And you are born from about. Unaided by anything, the witnesses come to bear witness to the fact that you are out. And God is born from about. And all these things happen within you. After this moment, of the exercise of this power. So you'll return to Zion and you will dwell forever in Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth for this is where truth reigns. All on the outside where you went was all one grand delusion. In the end it will all fade and leaving not a little trace behind it. So tonight you try it. Try what I have just given you as a technique. Just try it. Can't lose anything. But may I warn you, do it in love. Whenever you're in doubt, do the loving thing. And you have done the right thing. Whenever in doubt, do the loving thing. And so tonight, you would like to be, always go with the golden rule. Is it something that you wish for yourself, that you wish for another? Then. It's all right. Do you wish for another what you would not want done to you? Then it's not right. Always be guided by the golden rule. And the golden rule is a simple thing. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So whenever in doubt, do the loving thing. Would you like to be healthy? What's wrong with that? Would you like to be secure? What's wrong with that? Would you like to be, well, kind and considerate, oh, what's wrong with it? Or bring before your mind's eye those who would know that you are and just tell them that you are. Look into their faces and tell them and then release them and they're on their way to prove it. Now let us go into the silence. 